And so, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Derek Sheffield, and I teach also in the English department here, along with my colleague, Heather Ryan. And um, as, you, as you may notice, those of you in Heather's class, you're in a different classroom today, okay? Um, so I'm just gonna break that news to you right now. And those of you in my class who are here uh, every day, uh, just about, um, we have some people joining us. They are actually students of Heather's um, in her English 112, which is Introduction to Fiction, okay, her 112 class. So they've been uh, working on studying fiction uh, from more of a literary perspective, perhaps too as, as a, from a writer as well. Um, but the focus more is on encountering um, stories and novels and, um, and how they live in us as readers. And, and, and here, as you know, in English 135, creative writing, our focus, we've, done, we've read some models as well, uh, but our focus really is on looking at those models and um, having you write your own work uh, using some of the tools that those models employ. So it's, it, it, it's a great pleasure for me to have my colleague Heather Ryan uh, with us today. You've all read her story, Girl Emerges from Landscape, and she has kindly consented to answer some questions that we might have about that story. Now I put down a few of the terms that we're, we're sort of still in the beginning of our fiction unit here. I just put down a few terms that we have um, been uh, using, um, that, that we have been using so far in our fiction unit and uh, as, as a way to, um, uh, to keep those in mind as we ask our questions. <clears throat> now, um, and then I would just say, in my students, as you know, my specialty is poetry. I have an MFA in poetry from the University of Washington, and it was so great uh, for us a couple years ago to add Heather Ryan to our, uh, our uh, staff here, um, because she is an MFA in fiction, and so she really added to us. We didn't have a real fiction expert until she got here. So, and I believe it's from uh, University of Oregon State, was it? Or? You do that, I know you're doing it on purpose. Okay. <laughs> it's from University of Oregon. University of Oregon, that's right, okay, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're bitter rivals, so OSU and you yeah. 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 So, that's all I need to say. Uh, right now, I want to uh, turn it over here to you and Heather, and um, uh, maybe if, if we have someone uh, do you want to say anything at all before we get going? It might be easier to start with, because I'm, I'm sure there'll be some general questions and then I can kind of I know, launch. yeah, I know uh, some people, several people are interested in if this story has any relationship has to that, your life. Yeah. To the, to the or the way other people put it is, how true is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you read fiction, is that what you wonder? Mm -hmm. Or where the idea comes from. So that's a different question than where than true, right? True, whatever true means. Um, so <clears throat> that's something we should probably talk about. Like, what does it mean to be true versus what does it mean to be factual? I feel like there's always this way in which people are trying to ask for both things, right? Um, so. Well, let me kind of turn it on to you a little bit, and then I promise I'll answer you. I won't be coy. Um, <laughs> what, why, what makes you ask whether it's true or not? Or how much is true? Like, why is that important to you? It's, it sounds so real. Like, it's, it's things that happen every day, and it sounds like it really did happen. You're good with the description. Yeah, you did. Oh, I was just, it's interesting, like any time that a child is kidnapped, it tends to make five o'clock news, and it did in the story as well, right? It's got yeah, something that's an interesting read. So one of the things I think you have to be careful of when you're writing fiction is like this idea of true, the capital T, 
which for most people means factual, right? But, you know, the goal of fiction is to provide some bigger truth through virtue of, of fakery, through artifice. Does that make sense? So, sometimes we ask this question because we think it can't possibly be fake, it feels too real, right? So, I just want you to be careful about that um, because what we're really, I mean, true, does it feel true? Does it say something bigger about the world? That's what it's supposed to do, right? Um, so someone asked over here about where the idea came from. Yeah. So I almost never tell people like how much is true and how much isn't because it's kind of like it's like a magician saying like here's here's how the, the mirrors line up, right? And um, but. In this case, I think it's a good thing to talk about because um, it, it kind of talks about my process a little bit. Um, for me, most writing, most fiction writing comes from an image or, or a piece of conversation that I have or, or something that comes to me that I, that I experience that sticks for whatever reason. And usually it sticks because I don't quite, either it's really just really, really cool and like fun and funny, or I don't understand it. So like a really good example is, um, do you all know Nelson Martin? He's like a business econ teacher. He's telling me this story about how, now I can't remember who, maybe it was his mother-in-law, maybe it was his uh, grandmother, I don't remember. She would always, she never liked to bake, and she would always, but whenever they had guests, she would bake this uh, lime pie, kind of like key lime pie, but a little bit different. And the only reason she did that dessert was because her dishes, her dessert plates, they're really beautiful, had a thin green stripe around the edge, and she <laughs> wanted it to match. That says something, like, I know that person now from that one story. Do you know what I mean? And like, he told me that like maybe when I first started here two years ago. And I, I'm like, that's someday going into the story. Like, that is such a perfect way to encapsulate a certain kind of person. Do you know what I mean? Like, you're not gonna make any other dessert, you're gonna make this forever and ever and ever because it max, matches your china plates perfectly, right? So, um, for this story, I actually knew someone who was kidnapped. And, um, and I saw it on the news, and that end image happened. Like, I'm not the character, so I didn't have those feelings, but they found her walking naked out of the field, and it was on the news. And they like pixelated her body, and a police officer drove out on a motorcycle because everyone was like shouting. They were like looking for her because it was really close to where they found the vehicle that had been abandoned. And and I can't remember. It was outside of Stockton, so I lived in Lodi, um, in that the whole Central Valley. And I don't remember. I don't remember what city it was closest to because there were a lot of little outlying cities. But um, the police officer ro rode out on his motorcycle and took off his shirt. And then they cut away. And it was this moment of like, I can't believe that just happened. Right? But that happened in uh, 94, 95. And I didn't know what to make of it. Like, it was kind of one of those moments that it's not the kind of fun story you can tell, it's a terrible story. Right? Like, I can tell the thing about the plate. Like, it's fun. Do you know what I mean? But how do you say, oh, I have this great, interesting story? You know, someone I know got kidnapped, right? And they found her, and it was on news. Um, and she was walking out of the field without her clothes on. So for a long time, I kind of just had that, and I have a ton of these. Like, I even actually have a file in my computer with different things that I'm just like, this might be a story someday, right? Um, but it took me. Yeah. But in addition to this might be a story someday, clearly this this moved you uh, on a deep level. This was uh, this was a, a powerfully emotional response that you had to this this image right. and the story. Well, and it was. And you knew there was something there. Yeah. That because it moved you that way. Yeah. So the interesting thing about this too is that I don't know how you feel when you're writing. But for me, if I know what I'm, what I'm going to, if I know the answer, 
it's not fun to write and I don't write anymore. Like the story is dead. Um, so I think they call that a research essay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think even in nonfiction, like you should feel like you're getting I, somewhere. I agree. Right? I agree. So um, I didn't, I didn't understand it for a really long time. I'm not sure that I still understand it because it made me feel. It, all these things in really complicated ways. Like I was really glad that she had been found, obviously, right? But I was also really sad. It was really horrifying. She wasn't very old. I think she was 12. Um, and, and kind of how to contend with that. But the story I knew for a long time, you know, I kind of have, I have a lot of these little things and kind of running around in the back of my head. Um, it wouldn't work as a kidnap story. Like, kidnap story is not very interesting. It has to be something else, too. So, um, and we can probably get into that, but I don't want to just lecture. So what other questions do you have for me? As, as, as I'm listening, uh, we've got some questions here, but I want to add, too, as I'm listening to you, um, one of the things about the kidnap story is that it's been done so often and so well already, and as Pound advised, make it new. And so, um, to me, your story does that. It's, it, it travels. It goes somewhere else. Which right, is, because the turning point, the climax should be the person's found, and that should be the resolution, but that's not the resolution here, right? So, I, um, at the University of Oregon, my advisor and dear friend, he passed away in November. Um, he's a really amazing writer. His name is Ed Kupabazelet. Um, he wrote this thing, he would like, we'd be in grad school, and he would write us on the board every time. And, and like, it's, so it's really important to understanding fiction. We always called it the wedge. <laughs> it's very simple. Um, and the idea is that you have to really, to have a good short story, you have to have two stories. And one story is operating here, on the surface. This is all the plot. Right? But at each moment, it has to put you into a deeper understanding of the character. And if it doesn't do that, then Ahud would say, it's not, it's not worth my time. It's not worth your time. And so this, this part is easy. What happens, right? This part's really hard. So the kidnapping, we would think of kidnapping as very, being very plot driven. This has to happen, and then this has to happen, and then this has to happen. And so that would be here. But what, it only becomes dynamic and interesting and fresh if the character is responding in the only way the character can. Right? Nobody else would respond to this different. I mean, the same. Okay. Is that what kind of you're talking about? That's great. Um, would you, is another word for that subtext? Or is that different? It's a little different. I think it's different because I think subtext is like, like subtext is sort of like, well, how do you know that Jeremy is like not a, the best person in the story? That's like all subtext, right? Like he doesn't right. do anything really horrible. Um, but this would be our understanding of Haley. And by the end, we know her really well. Yeah, that the arrow going down. Yeah. That's Haley's story. Yeah. yeah. Right. And in first person narration, and this is why I put tension up here. In first person narration, the narrator never wants to tell you what the story is. 100% of the time, in first person narration, the narrator is lying. That's different than unreliable. Have you talked about unreliable? <coughs> Not yet. Okay. Um, unreliable narrator is like you have someone who's maybe like mentally ill or really young or for whatever reason can't. At, like they want to tell you the truth, but they can't. Okay. Um, but I learned, and I agree with this idea that the only way you create tension in a first-person narration story is for the narrator to say, "This is a story about A, but it's always a story about this thing that I don't really want to tell you." So, what is the story that Haley wants to tell you? This is about. Yeah, and the narration, the story never lets her get away. 
So it's constantly pushing on her. And the challenge as a writer is, and that's where the tension comes from. Does that make sense? Because if the first person narrator told you, hey, I had an abortion, I'm really sad about it, I don't know what to think about it, you'd be like, okay, right? <laughs> like it's not interesting. It has to feel like a sense of discovery for the narrator and the reader. So the narrator lies to you the whole time. The first line, I'm telling you the story about this girl. It's not about me, it's not about me, but every so often, she's like she can't help it, right? comes back on her, okay? And the challenge is, in doing it, is kind of getting around the narrator and forcing them to do things and admit things that they don't want to admit. Putting them in a position where they have to. There's no other way out. So, when I was in graduate school, you know, Ehud would do things like this. He'd be like, you're about right here. <laughs> And you'd be like, everything sucks. <laughs> Why am I writing? <laughs> <laughs> so it takes a really long time to kind of do, be able to do some, something like this and do it artfully. And you have to mess up a lot. Um, Eden, you had a question. Oh, I was going to ask whether the kidnapping was intended as the primary story or whether you wanted to write a story about the abortion? I think, so sometimes people, different writers view this different ways, but I think that both of the stories have to be there. And that's where the conflict comes from. So neither story is primary. Um, Haley wants to tell you the kidnapping story is primary. Oh, is that like a long one? Yeah. <laughs> the hard thing as a writer, if you're, I mean, do you, do you all like to write first person narration? Yeah. Do you find that you write it more than third person? Yeah. It feels really good. It feels really easy because it's voice driven. Like you hear this person, right? But I think in some ways it's harder because you have to be able to find that tension. And the, the tension is always like, I'm telling you this, I'm telling you this. Don't look over here, don't look over here, and eventually that has to come in, right? Um, what other stories do you have for me? Stories, what other questions do you have for me? Um, So as I was writing it, I had this event in my, the back of my head, this image, it, more like just the image. And I remember sitting on the couch and watching the news and being like, not, not sure how to feel about it. Um, I really think that writing is a form of discovery. Like you're discovering this about the characters as you're creating them. You're discovering um, maybe how you feel about something or how a part of you feels about something. You're trying to inhabit another person. And so, for me, I knew, for me, when you get the, right, the narrator to admit the thing that they, they never would admit, right? Where you force, the, force it so that it's really clear to everybody. That's the moment that you can stop. And you might need to still add a few more things, right? Tie up new sense. But, for me, I think of fiction as being all about the character, when it's character driven, right? It's all about what the character needs. And the character need is always connected to the character's um, limitation as a person. So, you know, we're all limited as people, right? And we all have biases, we all have problems, we all have things that we're not very good at. And <clears throat> You, write, you should be writing characters that have limitations. Which is not interesting, right? Um, and for me, in a, you know, because a work of fiction, a work of fiction is fake, right? It's this artifice that we created to, look, to approximate reality. And so in fiction, you can do things like make the need and the limitation really connected. So, I mean, what does Haley need? What are her limitations as a person, as a character? 
And when I got her to admit that, right, this kind of terrible, terrible darkness in her, I knew it was done. And that's usually how I know. Um, Chekhov, I think, has this great line where he said that he would know when a story was done when he could return the characters to life. Like, he's had, he's played with them. I always imagine him like the dolls or something. <laughs> right? And have you read Chekhov at all? Everybody's sad. Think my story's sad? Wait until you're writing about characters in Siberia in like the 19th century. <laughs> it's not happy times, right? So, you know, um, I always think of him as like kind of putting these characters in motion and then being able, to this moment when you know you've got to let them go and they return back into the, the bigger world. So that's where it is. Question? Yeah. Uh, how long did the process take to write the whole story? For this story? Yeah. So, this is not a normal story. Um, I wrote all of it in like four hours. And then I revised it once, and it was done. That never, that's happened to me once. <laughs> um, most of the time I write 30, 15 to 30 drafts of a story. And, the, and four or five of those will be really big. Like huge character changes, place, like big structural changes. Um, and then the others are just like fine tuning and moving things and really, you know, the challenge with writing, I think, is that um, it's sort of like creating a new computer program. Like, you know when you, people create new computer programs, there are all these bugs, right? And they send out beta versions and they test them and they come back and they fix, fix the bugs. But in fixing the bugs, you create more problems, yeah. right? So this, the same thing happens with fiction. You have like three or four really big problems and you, you attempt to fix them and in fixing those, you still have usually five or six small problems. So you fix those, and ideally the problems are getting fewer and smaller, right? Um, so normal, normal for me, but I mean, I've thought about this for a really long time, like 20 years, 25 years, before I put it on the paper. So it was in my head for a long time, just kind of like, I wonder what that means, like I wonder what I could do with it. Um, but I have stories that like, I'm working on a story now that I wrote in graduate school, so that was a long time ago. That I wrote it, the last time I looked at it was 10 years ago. And I was, and that's, when I wrote it, I was like, sucks, I hate it. Um, how many of you feel like that when you write something? You're like, why? Yeah. Um, you go back and read something from like two months ago, and you're like, why did I write that? Yes. And so this was a, the story that I worked on. Um, I was really playing with point of view in third person and doing this kind of back and forth in the same short story between two characters. And doing that is really technical. Like, you have to like make sure the reader knows, like, OK, I'm in this other person now. Right, and kind of get close in psychological distance, and then oh, okay, I'm gonna switch. And it was kind of just to see if I could do it, and then at the end, just because it wasn't hard enough, I merged them in the last scene, <laughs> just to see if I could, and I could, but it was kind of like it was more it was more like doing layups in a, as a basketball player, like you're just doing you're practicing, you know what I mean? And I so I put it away and said like this is just like a technical thing that I worked on to figure some stuff out. And for some reason I found it and I was like, oh, this isn't bad. Like there's some really good stuff in here. And so, um, but it took 10 years for it to just sit there. And I deleted half of it. So I took one person all the way out. But it took a while before I realized like, oh, here's, this, here's the character I want to follow. And that, that exercise I did was really important, right? Helping me learn third person really well. But I don't need it anymore. I can just delete half of it. And after 10 years, it feels fine to delete half. After like a few days, you're like, I can't delete really half of this. It's really long, it's like 20 pages. So to delete 10 pages feels terrible, right? After 10 years, you're like, whatever. <laughs> I mean, he's still in there, but all of his points of view are gone. What? No, no, not in this story. A, diff a totally different story. Yeah. I don't remember that guy's name. Nathaniel. What other questions do you have? Yeah. So you might have already like explained it, but can you explain again the last two lines of the story? Because that kind of confused me, like how she was jealous and wanted to be found by the world, like she did. Yeah, the last, do you mean last sentence or do you mean the last? Yeah, I think it was last sentence. Or the last two sentences. 
Yeah, I lost you. Which one? Oh, the one about how she was she was wishing she could be found by the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was. Okay, so. Let's just look at the whole last paragraph. It's a little bit easier. Um, do all of you have copies of it or no? You do? Thanks, Derek. I got one. <laughs> all right, so how to say that it was a sight of the police officer rushing through a field of tall, dead grass just to cover her body, or that it was the way the news, first local and then national, looped the moment Elizabeth went from lost to found. How to say finally that some dark part of me wanted to be Elizabeth so I could be rescued in front of the world, too. I'm going to make, make you guys work a little bit. What do we know about Haley at this point? I mean, at least factual stuff we could get out of the way. Yeah? That she recently had an operation, sort of alluded to an abortion, but mm -hmm. never mentioned, and that she's um, has some guilt associated, trying to forgive herself, probably. But I think that's Good. But, but what else? Garcia? That she's doing college, like a community level college, but she's also working in a very early morning paper route so that she can pay for it because her job at the call office isn't enough to. So, two so. jobs, right? Um, Okay, so that's good. All that's good factual stuff. What do we know about what kind of person is she? What do you get from this about her? She's trying to deny what happened to her. Or, or ignore it. Maybe ignore or make sure it kind of doesn't feel better. When you say what happens to her, what do you mean? Um, the, it, she never directly addresses the abortion. Good. She is, is talks about the, um, even when she's relating to the kidnapping, She's imagining all the things that the kid, that the girl went through, and, and pointing out how they never addressed it as rape, just as they never addressed her abortion mm -hmm. in the story. Yep. Um, so she's kind of trying to hide it, trying to kind of push through it. And well, there's a way that we culturally we both we talk about those things very very much like that, right? Like we sort of deny that those things exist. We we say things like operation instead of abortion. Or we say things like, um, I mean, even sexually assaulted, even though we all know what that means, right? Um, rape is an uglier word, and we don't like that word. It kind of softens it a little bit, right? So I think even without even knowing, she's kind of picking up on these differences. What else do we know about her? Uh, she wanted to help a lot in some of those, but then she kind of had that block where she was like, oh, wait, no, I can't. Right. Well, Jeremy doesn't let her. What do we know about Jeremy? Yeah, I feel like he controls a lot of her life and manipulates her. And you're almost confused as why her ability is such a poverty too, because mm -hmm. it seems like she had everything going for her and she was going to, you know, really be a successful person. And maybe something happened, you know, she's going to do jobs and she's had an operation. And, right. You know, it's just... Jeremy's not like, when we think of a manipulative, controlling, Partner, what does that normally look like? Abuse, but physically, we think of that, right? Like, and that would maybe be the easiest way to write it, right? But I think Haley doesn't even know what she thinks. Like, she just knows there's this moment of, I think, recognition in seeing Elizabeth come out of the field and feeling, you know, one, I think, glad, relieved. Because what has Jeremy said? was likely to happen. She was dead. Okay. And that's, I mean, that's really common, right? Um, but is there, there's nobody to rescue Haley. Nobody even recognizes. This looks like kind of like normal. Like, I don't even know if we would, like you said abusive, I and mean, that's how we normally think of it. You said manipulative. And I think manipulative is better than abusive. Do you know what I mean? In this, in this sense, but is it healthy and good? No. So, but how old is she? Yeah, she's not that old. Um, she doesn't even know. I mean, have there been times in your life, and I mean, the answer has to be yes because you're human, but um, you're experiencing something and you're 
overwhelmed by the experience of it and you know that something important is happening but you don't fully understand it. And it's only in retrospect that you say, oh, that's what that meant. So I think that's kind of what's happening here. She doesn't even know how to say it. She's, she's only 20. But she recognizes something within herself as she's watching you know, Elizabeth come out of the field. I wish someone were here to rescue me too. No one's coming. This is not a situation. It's not the same, right? It's also kind of terrible, like very selfish. Well, I, I, what I, one of the things I really admire about this story is how um, well characterized Jeremy is and how understated is his manipulative behavior and how you really have to read the story closely. And, and, and two, that feels real to me. We mm -hmm. talked about true. You know, it, it, more often in life, we don't have these, you know, one-sided bullies who say, it's my way or the highway, girl. Get out there and get those papers delivered. You know, it's much more uh, complex than that. And, and he's more complex. But uh, his manipulative nature and then also how limited he is, really, as a person. And that his response to this um, event is that, wow, that sucks. Which is the same thing he said about burning the popcorn. Right. You know, and that's so, just so beautifully, subtly understated that, that, that we, you know, just sort of piece this together. It's all paced throughout the whole story. And then to the, near the end, when he actually is feeling deflated because he's wrong that she wasn't killed. Are you kidding me? But we know people like that, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I, I feel like I've known people who, you know, re respond to someone being kidnapped might be, it's, that sucks, <laughs> right? Their same response to something uh, relatively benign and everyday uh, annoyance. And I think, I think literature's job is to give a window into something that feels really authentic. Mm -hmm. That you're, we are all faced with people who are really limited and complex, and sometimes good and sometimes bad, right? And I don't even know if Jeremy is aware of how manipulative he is, do you know what I mean? But he's not very old either. Well, you know, and the beautiful irony, hey boss, what's going on? Calling her boss. Yeah. When did when did that come along in the story? I, was that early in your? It, was that in the revision? I guess this is a different kind of story because I was thinking about this in so terms of I got it many from, drafts. Um, so it's funny because I think to people it feels really um, like complete and it flows really well, but to me I see all the like patchwork. Mm -hmm. So I used to call my oldest child boss. When she's a baby, because when you have a baby, they are kind of the boss, right? And and I would say I don't know if any of you've seen Cool Hand Luke, which is a great movie. If you haven't seen it, you need to go watch it. Digging this ditch here, boss. Yep, exactly. Thanks for being so good to me, boss. Like when he's like treating them terribly. Um, and so I would always say, and my husband would always say, um, "Thanks, boss." She's like crying, right? And it's funny. It's just like this ironic thing, but it's also kind of true. So I just kind of was thinking of that, even though it's not at all the same, but just that sort of like calling somebody boss when they're not really boss, right? In my daughter's case, it was kind of true, because when you have a baby, they kind of run everything. <laughs> they wake up all the time, they're terrible. Um, but I lived in Lodi for a long time in Stockton, so I kind of knew the area as well. So the description in that way came really easy. Yeah. Had you ever <laughs> delivered papers? Yeah. You have? Yeah, as a kid. Yeah. So you were able to draw on that experience um, yeah. when you wrote these two. Yeah, I delivered papers when I was 12 to 14, I think, around that time. I don't remember. Um, but, you know, getting up really early and, and I don't, just kind of seeing different stuff on the headlines, but not that. Yeah. Yeah. Stephanie. So, why was there such a big emphasis on delivering newspapers? And I say big emphasis, and because it was kind of broken into three parts. There were page breaks, 
between sections talking just about the paper rounds. So what was the significance of that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> what pages are they on? Do you have it for me? Yeah, they're on page So sometimes pages. when you're writing, a lot of what you're writing is just also like, man, I gotta get this character from here to here. Hmm. And like, a lot of it just becomes like kind of technical, like, I need this person to be doing this, right? Um, the interesting thing, has anyone delivered papers before? Yeah. So you're, you're up really early, and I always really liked it because nobody is awake. Um, so I used to get up at 4.30? I can't remember. I think it was 4.30 and deliver papers, and, and I think my drop was like at 4 at my house. And so I would, and nobody's awake. It was very, very peaceful. Everything felt really um, perfect, kind of safe. And I grew up in, when I delivered papers, I lived in Stockton, which is not a safe place. And I lived in a fine neighborhood, but um, like people were routinely like stabbed at my school. Um, I, sometimes I would go to the mall and there'd be a shooting and so you couldn't go. And I'd just be like, really wanted Orange Julius. Like, <laughs> it's just very like, you're just very used to like this kind of awful, all over the top violence all the time. And I had a paper and it felt like the world was this beautiful place where people, you know, the light would just be coming up. And Central California um, was usually pretty warm. So we, ne we never had snow ever, and that I lived there. And so it was always kind of a fine weather. I mean, sometimes it's raining. The worst would happen to be terrible fog. The fog was kind of beautiful. So when I think of paper routes and, and folding papers, I think of this tran tranquil place where I would often have like, I would just be thinking, kind of meditating, and even as a 12 year old, I'd be thinking about different stuff, you know, thinking about things I had read. Um, I, I wrote a lot then, so I'd be thinking about things I was gonna write. So it's kind of this place, so I think that's probably why I hadn't noticed that. So this kind of touches on, on that, how you broke it up into sections. You said you wrote it really fast, and you said you don't want to write something if you um, if there's not a surprise in it for you. How much of it was um, outlined and structured? Um, so on paper, none, because I don't do that. Okay. Um, I feel, if I outline, I feel really hemmed in by what I've written down. Uh, but it, it does work for some people, so I don't want to say don't do it. Um, Normally when I write first draft, I just get as much down as I can, and I don't worry about the jumps, right? Or the places where I'm moving around, or the transitions. I, I just try to get the story down. Um, and so, it just came. It doesn't happen very often, and I think it only happens when you really write a lot. So, I've been writing since I was six, and I'm 42. I wrote this five years, four or five years ago, five years ago. So, 31 years of writing. And you get one that comes really easily. It doesn't happen very often. So, I don't know if I, that really answered your question, but as I was going through, I was sort of like thinking about how that image has to come in somewhere, and not exactly sure when. And it was kind of like the last little bit when I was writing that I just knew, maybe the last page. Okay, here's what's gonna happen. And it felt right. So, question. So, I was wondering about your title. For me, when I usually write the title, it's more difficult mm -hmm. because if you're having two situations and your title may be affecting it, I'm wondering, like, since you kind of did that same time on the right. ending, did you get it from I hate titles. Yeah. <laughs> titles are, I think, the hardest part, and so usually for me, I have like working titles. So this for for I think I actually had this completed, and I wasn't one hundred percent sure what the title was going to be, and I just kept calling it "Kidnap Story." <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, and oftentimes I have really terrible titles. That my first like, and I know I'm going to change. It's just terrible. Um, but for me, I know I know when a story is done when I know the title. Like the title is kind of like the cherry. It's the thing you know, the, the like last little flourish. And I think I read it through, as I recall, and I was like, oh, it's right here. 
it doesn't often come like that. Like that sometimes it takes a lot of work. And so I, I will give my stories to my friends who are my readers and say, Do you have any ideas? Um, do you all so you're all writing? Do you did you write before you got to this class? Like fiction and stuff? Do you have people that you share your writing with who are also writers? That's something you want to try to develop. So your readers, like these people that you are close with, um, that you can share work with, they don't have to write like you, but they have to get you. And by get you, it doesn't mean that they just say, oh, it's good, right? They have to call you out when it doesn't work. And they have to be someone who's who has a good eye for you. And, and for me, I have two people who um, are really good readers for me, and we read each other's work and we swap all the time. Um, J.T. Bushnell, who's written a lot of fiction, um, who lives in Corvallis, and Mike Kofferman, who also has written a lot of fiction and nonfiction. And his memoir comes out in September. It's really good. So two writing groups have formed from students in English 130 in previous classes uh, that are still meeting in town, um, where That's students good. left the class and kept kept writing and kept meeting. That's so important. Um, because it's hard to be able to see your own work sometimes for what it is, what it's doing, what it's not doing. And having a good reader is, some, is someone who knows it well enough to tell you. To both hold you, hold you accountable, but also to say, this right here that you don't really like, no, 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 this works really well. So when I first wrote this, I kind of mistrusted it because it, it came so easily. And so I sent it to JT and he's like, I don't, I don't know why you're sending this to me. <laughs> it's done. That's what you always want to hear. You bring a you bring a piece to a workshop. You want to hear, and, and of course it never happens. It almost you know, never you happens. You never get. It. Yeah. Oh, oh, this is oh, it's perfect. Wow. No. Um, hey, I'll tell you one of the happy accidents or things that uh, happened in this story was the uh, you know this this detail of Haley. Folding the headline, Girl Emerges from Landscape into Itself 147 Times. Uh, that was, when I first read the story, that was so powerful to me because the stories were coming together so acutely right there. And, uh, you know, this is before the final epiphany. But just that image of her having having to fold this 147 times after, yeah. you know, and, and we were, I was sharing uh, her, her grief, her, um, how she was, you know, at that time, her, her pain. And uh, that, uh, I think, is, is really brilliant. Thank you. I think it goes right back to your wedge, right? So yeah. the title was like, perfect, it goes both lines. Knits it all together and it's the long arrow. I think that what you mentioned, Derek, is a long arrow. Yeah. Um, yes, yes. So that was like, I mean, I, I think those moments often are gifts to the writer as you're writing. If you're really in the character, you're really in the story, they come. Mm -hmm. And you're not even sure that they're coming until they're there. Um, there's this famous writer, Bernard Malmood, who taught at Oregon State University for a long time. Um, and he's really, really amazing Jewish writer. Um, I don't know, he's been dead for a long time, but he apparently, because there were all these people who were there who had worked with him still, they were um, retiring. They, they had been younger when, when they started. And was, allegedly he would like write in his office all the time, and every once in a while he would come out and just proclaim, a gift! Like he would get a really good line. <laughs> and then he'd go back in. Um, <clears throat> and so I think sometimes when you're really doing the work, you know, I always kind of like liken it to sports analogies. If you see like uh, Michael Jordan, you know, make a shot or LeBron James, like it looks like art. Do you know what I mean? It looks like beauty. And, but we forget how much work it took, how much practice before it, you got there to that moment. And so sometimes I think those come, but they only come because you're, you're reading a lot, you're writing a lot, and then every once in a while it happens. Um, and also one final note, like, because we talked about the ending, I, the ending should feel like almost bigger than explanation, in my opinion, like, 
Uh, an ending shouldn't be like a math equation. Like I don't like stories when they're like, well, A equals B. Or you might have had teachers who did this before too. Um, sometimes some lit teachers are famous for doing this, right? The blue represents depression. Like sometimes it's just blue. Yeah. Right. Um, but art is supposed to open the world up to us, and it's supposed to make the world more complicated. It's not supposed to reduce it. So I'm always trying to go for this feeling that's almost like you feel it emotionally, but you all, like it's all these different things, but also it has to be narrow enough to fit within the frame of the story. So it's kind of hard. But sometimes it works. Yeah. I do have a daughter named Chloe. She's next door. I went in there, we should stop recording. I went in there and messed up Dustin's notes. <laughs> Just to play with him. <laughs> Dustin Clark. I'll um, keep that going. Next time. I'll give that to Dustin. <laughs> Just one. I just swapped one. Well, I mean, I read the story, and, I, and you know, it's, it's no longer in your hands. What the writer thinks the story is doesn't really matter anymore. They don't have the last word on it. And so the way I read it is really as a, as a powerful, um, you might say, feminist story. Uh, you might yeah. say individualist story. I see uh, a speaker who is on the verge of, of uh, actualizing herself. Um, and I feel that coming out in particular, not just because of her relationship with Jeremy, but because of what she tells us about uh, mama O, you know, she's like, I don't need another mama, you know, mama O, uh, even though she was a, a fine person or something, but this is, this is someone who, um, who is, um, we, we see her, you know, before she actualizes herself, before she really um, steps into herself and owns um, her, her true capabilities. Those stories are the most interesting, I think, the moment before transformation as opposed to the transformation itself. Um, how did you get to this point where maybe something bigger will happen? Um, and kind of the upheaval that has to occur before you grow as a person. Upheaval. Yeah. Any last uh, comments or words before we end our class today? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, when you're writing, do you ever find yourself Putting a lot of yourself in your characters, and how do you keep them yeah. um, I think when you're first writing, it's just really natural because you go to a place that you know. So I wouldn't try not to necessarily, but try to think of it as stretching a muscle where over time you're going to push a little bit farther and farther. And for me, it's because I want to do different things with the character that aren't like me um, that I start pushing out. I will say too, when you start writing about people you don't like, like sometimes I've made, and we were talking about this recently um, in my class, making a character uh, out of somebody you hate, and you're going to vilify them, and how poorly that can go. Um, <laughs> and Ehud happens a lot, I mean Ehud was a, a close friend of mine, a wonderful person, and he, tells, he told this story about writing, because he, he had a lot of conflict with his dad, which a lot of people do, right? So he wrote this novel about a character very much like his dad. I don't know to vilify, but to just like say, well, he was a bad person, right? And the process of writing should make you love, you should love your characters, even as they do terrible things. Like, it should make you see their humanity. So um, he always said that by the end of the book, his dad was pure, and he had to reckon with the fact that he had misjudged his father. And that was kind of the, the act of writing the novel brought him to that point of humanity. Um, so if you're focusing on yourself, you can only get so far, right? So try to look at other people and pull them in, and then just expand from that. But treat it as a muscle. If you stretch too much at once, it's going to hurt, right? So just kind of push it over time. Which goes back to your point about art as a discovery process. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he realized he wrote towards a truer, deeper understanding of his relationship with his father. You know, we write towards uh, Well, he towards would always that. say, um, and he said this over and over, and I say it to my students, you have to write to the pain. So whatever hurts, 
It doesn't mean that it's going to be nonfiction on the page, right? But, uh, but you should go towards that. That's the place where all the really important, interesting stuff happens, that you can discover things about yourself. It's like when they asked Hemingway, why do you write? He said, for the pain. That sounds sadistic. Yeah, but I think that's what we do. <laughs> Thank you.